Welcome, my friends, to a land where logic takes a holiday and silliness reigns supreme. A realm ruled by the most peculiar monarch, the Hysteria King. Imagine a ruler who wears a royal yellow cloak, a powdered wig slightly askew, and carries not a scepter, but a spoon and an egg holder, with a single pristine egg nestled inside. Yes, you heard right. This, my friends, is the Hysteria King, a monarch known for his booming laughter and a fondness for the utterly absurd. The Hysteria King wasn't content with merely presiding over his whimsical kingdom. Oh no, our dear king had a craving, a hankering for something so legendary, so unbelievably delicious, that it could make a grown man weep with joy. The legendary cheesecake! Now this wasn't your ordinary run-of-the-mill cheesecake. This cheesecake was rumored to be baked by the gods themselves, using only the finest moon cheese and unicorn tears. Legend had it that this mythical dessert was hidden away in a distant castle, guarded by ludicrous dangers and guarded by the most bizarre adversaries. Undeterred, the Asteria King knew what he had to do. He needed to assemble a team, a fellowship of the most extraordinary, the most ridiculous, the most side-splittingly funny cartoon characters the land had ever seen. And so began the quest for the legendary cheesecake, a quest that would take them through fields of singing daisies, across rivers of orange soda, and into the very heart of absurdity itself. Buckle up, my friends, for this is going to be one hilarious ride. Now, assembling a team of heroes is no easy feat, especially when your candidates are more likely to start a food fight than a heroic quest. But the Hysteria King, bless his wacky soul, wasn't phased. He sent out his messengers, a flock of carrier pigeons trained to sing opera, with invitations to the furthest corners of the cartoon universe. And boy, did they answer the call. From Quahog to Springfield, from Bikini Bottom to the Muppet Theater, they came. Peter Griffin, his trusty lighter thumb at the ready, Homer Simpson, perpetually hungry and easily distracted by donuts. Yosemite Sam, itching for a good old-fashioned shootout. And Uncle Fred, the cool ogre, radiating chill vibes and a surprising amount of wisdom. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. We had Rick the Cool Ogre, Peter Griffin's equally eccentric best friend, Nacho Libre, ready to body slam any obstacle in their path. Joe Swanson, offering words of encouragement and witty one-liners from his wheelchair. And Walter White, bringing his unique brand of problem solving though hopefully not involving any blue meth. The air crackled with anticipation, excitement, and the faint scent of Peter Griffin's questionable cooking. This was, without a doubt, the most strangely wonderful, ridiculously capable group of misfits ever assembled for a quest. The Hysteria King, beaming with pride and possibly a touch of madness, knew in his heart that this was the team that would finally find the legendary cheesecake. The quest, however, was not without its challenges. The map to the legendary cheesecake was no ordinary map. It was an ancient scroll, passed down through generations of pastry-loving squirrels, filled with riddles that would make a sphinx scratch its head. To reach the cheesecake, one must first face the taunter, whose words are sharper than a thousand spoons. What could it mean? What was a taunter? And why did it have so many spoons? These were just a few of the questions swirling through the minds of our heroes. But before they could delve any deeper into the mysteries of the map, a new problem arose. A problem of epic, rumbling, stomach-growling proportions. Good gravy, I'm hungry! bellowed Peter Griffin, clutching his stomach as if it were about to stage a rebellion. All this talk about cheesecake has got my appetite working overtime. He wasn't alone. The rest of the team, with the possible exception of Walter White, who was too busy analyzing the map's chemical composition, were starting to get a little peckish. And so, with the fate of the legendary cheesecake hanging in the balance, our heroes found themselves facing their first great challenge, finding a decent meal in a land where food was more likely to sing and dance than end up on a plate. After days of travel, following the whimsically vague instructions on the squirrel-approved treasure map, our heroes finally arrived at their destination. Not a bakery filled with the sweet aroma of baking cheesecakes, as Homer had desperately hoped. No, it was a grand, imposing castle, its walls covered in ivy and what appeared to be sentient gingerbread men. Don't ask, even the narrator doesn't know how that happened. Well, 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 he sneered, his voice dripping with sarcasm. What do we have here? A motley crew of misfits looking for a slice of the good stuff. You're delusional if you think you can get past me. I'm the taunter, and I've got insults sharper than a thousand baguettes. And thus began the taunter's tirade. He mocked their appearances, their intelligence, or lack thereof, and even the questionable fashion choices of some of the characters. Animal from the Muppets, unfortunately, became the primary target of this particular line of attack. 
the Hysteria King, ever the optimist, tried to reason with the taunter. Excuse me, good sir, he called out, his voice a booming contrast to the taunter's nasal tone. We come in peace, seeking only the legendary cheesecake. Surely there's enough deliciousness to go around. Peace? Cheesecake? You naive fools. This castle holds no cheesecake, only despair. And even if it did, I wouldn't share a single crumb with the likes of you. The Hysteria King, known for his sunny disposition, was starting to lose his patience. This taunter was more stubborn than a mule with a head full of molasses. They needed a plan, and fast, before Peter Griffin accidentally set fire to the castle with his lighter thumb. Again. Those fancy pants Frenchmen won't know what hit him. I see we blast our way in. Now, Sam, Uncle Fred the Cool Ogre interjected, ever the voice of reason. Violence is never the answer. Besides, I'm pretty sure this castle is protected by a magical force field powered by puns, one bad joke, and we're toast. The group fell silent, contemplating their options. Suddenly, Peter Griffin, who had been staring intently at a ladybug crawling up his arm, snapped his fingers. I got it. We'll build a giant wooden thingy and hide inside it. They'll never suspect a thing. And so, despite the skeptical looks from Walter White and Joe Swanson, the plan was set in motion. They gathered wood from the nearby forest, with Animal from the Muppets proving surprisingly adept at felling trees with his bare hands. Nails seemingly out of thin air. Peter Griffin's pockets were a veritable black hole of random objects. And within a few hours, they had constructed a giant wooden... Rabbit? The Trojan Rabbit, as they so creatively dubbed it, was not exactly a masterpiece of engineering. It was lopsided, held together more by hope and duct tape than actual carpentry skills. Still, it was their best shot, and they maneuvered their creation towards the castle gates with a mixture of trepidation and anticipation. All right, everyone, whispered the Hysteria King, his voice barely audible over the sound of Homer Simpson's stomach rumbling. Once they open the gates, we rush in, grab the cheesecake, and make a swift and dignified retreat. Got it? The others nodded, gripping their makeshift weapons, ranging from spatulas to rubber chickens. They waited, holding their breath, as the giant rabbit was dragged through the gates. Silence. Then the sound of laughter, echoing from within the castle walls. Did it work? whispered Peter Griffin, his eyes wide with excitement. Only one way to find out, muttered Walter White, pushing open the rabbit's door, escape hatch. It was hard to tell with this particular contraption, but as they stepped out, they realized their mistake. They were not inside the castle. They were in the middle of a field. The giant wooden rabbit lay abandoned behind them. Wait a minute, exclaimed Joe Swanson, his voice laced with disbelief. Did we forget to get inside the rabbit? The Hysteria King, despite his initial disappointment at the failed Trojan rabbit plan, was not one to give up easily. If they couldn't trick their way into the castle, they'd just have to storm it but how to breach those imposing walls. Fear not, my friends, he declared, his voice regaining its usual boisterous energy. For I, the Hysteria King, have a new plan. A plan so cunning, so daring, so utterly ridiculous that it just might work. And what, you might ask, was this brilliant plan? It involved, of course, food, specifically a massive, chaotic food fight. Think of it. We'll pelt them with watermelons, bombard them with baguettes, and unleash a torrent of, well, whatever Peter Griffin has in his pockets. It'll be glorious messy, and hopefully distracting enough for us to slip through the gates. And so, armed with an arsenal of fruits, vegetables, and questionable leftovers from Peter Griffin's backpack, the heroes launched their attack. Nacho Libre, with a mighty roar, hurled a watermelon with the force of a battering ram, creating a dent in the castle wall. Uncle Fred the Cool Ogre, utilizing his surprising agility, scaled a tower of croissants, lobbing baguettes like grenades. The French taunter and his knights, taken completely by surprise by this culinary assault, scrambled to defend themselves. They retaliated with volleys of cheese wheels, baguettes used as swords, and a particularly pungent cheese dip that sent Animal from the Muppets running for cover. The battle raged on, a symphony of shouts, splattering fruit, and the occasional bewildered moo from a stray cow that had wandered into the fray. But despite their best efforts, the heroes were outnumbered and outcheesed. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, a sound, faint at first, then growing louder, filled the air. Onwards, my fine feathered friends. Let them taste the wrath of the chicken run. The sky rained eggs. 
Not just ordinary eggs, mind you, but eggs launched with the velocity of cannonballs, propelled by the sheer unadulterated fury of a thousand vengeful chickens. The French taunter, caught completely off guard by this feathery assault, sputtered and choked, his face covered in yolk. The knights, their armor proving surprisingly ineffective against airborne eggs, scrambled for cover. Choking and sputtering. Sacre bleu! What is this madness? Chickens? Chickens! The chickens, their work done, soared away, leaving behind a scene of utter chaos. One particularly ambitious chicken, seemingly aiming for the taunter's head, had managed to create a sizable hole in the castle wall with its, well, let's just say it was a very sturdy egg. This was their chance. Walter White, leading the charge with surprising agility for a man who once faked his own death, slipped through the breach, followed by the Hysteria King, who was desperately trying to regain control of his feathered army. The interior of the castle was not what they expected. Instead of opulent hallways and chambers filled with treasure and hopefully cheesecake, they found themselves in a narrow, dimly lit corridor that smelled strongly of cheese and something else. Something indescribable, but definitely unpleasant. Good gravy. What died in here? A thousand Limburger sandwiches? That, said Walter White, his voice grim, is a man who has never heard the words portion control. This, my friends, was Mr. Creosote, a man whose appetite knew no bounds, a walking, talking, eating machine of epic proportions. Who, what is that? whispered the Hysteria King, his voice barely a squeak. They followed the stench, their stomachs churning, until they reached a pair of ornate double doors. Muffled voices, punctuated by the clinking of silverware and the occasional rather alarming belch emanated from within. Walter White, ever cautious, signaled for the others to stay back and slowly pushed the doors open. The sight that greeted them was both bizarre and terrifying. In a grand dining hall, lit by a thousand flickering candles, sat a man so large, so impossibly rotund, that he seemed to occupy the entire room. His face, what they could see of it beneath layers of sweat, and what they desperately hoped was gravy, was contorted in a mask of gluttonous ecstasy. He was surrounded by a small army of waiters, their faces pale and drawn, who rushed to and fro, piling his plate with even more food. A few brave souls, presumably other inhabitants of the castle, sat at nearby tables, attempting to enjoy their meals, while trying to ignore the spectacle unfolding before them. The heroes watched in horrified fascination as Mr. Creosote devoured everything in sight. Whole roasted chickens disappeared in a single bite. Piles of mashed potatoes vanished without a trace. A vat of what appeared to be cheese soup met its end with a horrifying gurgling sound. With each course, the stench in the room grew more potent, more unbearable. Animal from the Muppets, overcome by the aroma, fainted dead away. Even Homer Simpson, a man who prided himself on his iron stomach, looked a little queasy. You know, whispered Peter Griffin, his voice awed, I think I've lost my appetite. As if on cue, Mr. Creosote, his face now a disturbing shade of purple, let out a groan that rattled the very foundations of the castle. He clutched his stomach, his eyes bulging. It seemed the man had finally reached his limit. A hush fell over the room. The waiters, beads of sweat dripping from their brows, looked on with a mixture of fear and morbid curiosity. One brave soul, a waiter with trembling hands, approached Mr. Creosote, a silver tray in his hand. Just one more bite, wheezed Mr. Creosote, his voice a strangled gasp. The explosion was instantaneous and spectacularly messy. Mr. Creosote, unable to contain the sheer volume of food he had consumed, detonated with the force of a small bomb. The walls of the dining hall crumbled inwards, showering the heroes with debris, chunks of half-digested food, and what they sincerely hoped were not pieces of Mr. Creosote himself. When the dust settled and the ringing in their ears subsided, the heroes slowly picked themselves up from the pile of rubble that was once the grand dining hall. Coughing, sputtering, and trying desperately to brush the remnants of Mr. Creosote off their clothes, they surveyed the scene. Well, said Joe Swanson, his voice remarkably calm considering the circumstances, that was dim eventful. I told you we should have gone for the cheesecake, grumbled Homer Simpson, wiping a glob of what appeared to be mashed potatoes from his hair. The Hysteria King, his crown slightly askew but his spirits undimmed, clapped his hands together. Onwards, my friends, the legendary cheesecake awaits. And so, with renewed determination and a newfound appreciation for portion control, our heroes ventured deeper into the heart of the castle, 
leaving behind the wreckage of Mr. Creosote's last meal. Little did they know, their greatest challenges were yet to come. Emerging from the wreckage of the dining hall, our heroes found themselves in a vast courtyard, bathed in the eerie glow of the setting sun, but this was no ordinary courtyard. Oh no, this courtyard was... festive? Balloons bobbed in the breeze, streamers adorned the crumbling walls, and a calliope played a jaunty tune that would have been more at home in a circus than a medieval castle. And speaking of circuses, from a distant archway, a tiny car, its horn honking incessantly, sputtered into view. And then, the clowns emerged, dozens of them, maybe hundreds, pouring out of the impossibly small vehicle like a never-ending stream of brightly colored chaos. There were clowns on stilts, clowns with water balloons, clowns juggling rubber chickens, much to the annoyance of the castle's resident fowl population. One particularly enthusiastic clown, his face painted a disturbing shade of green, attempted to tie balloon animals around Uncle Fred the Cool Ogre's horns. What in tarnation is going on here, Yosemite? Sam sputtered, firing his pistols into the air in a vain attempt to restore order. This ain't no circus. It's a darned invasion. And indeed it was. For leading this motley crew of clowns, perched atop a miniature tank fashioned to look like a giant rubber ducky, was none other than Lord Farquaad, ruler of Duloc and connoisseur of all things diminutive and evil. What in tarnation is going on here? This ain't no circus. It's a darned invasion. The Hysteria King, momentarily stunned by this unexpected turn of events, quickly regained his composure. He might be a lover of silliness and cheesecake, but he was also a king by Jove, and he would not stand idly by while his quest was thwarted by a bunch of clowns. Cease this tomfoolery at once, he boomed, his voice echoing across the courtyard. This is a quest for cheesecake, not a three-ring circus. Cease this tomfoolery at once. This is a quest for cheesecake, not a three-ring circus. Silence, you oversized buffoon. This castle and the cheesecake within are mine. I, Lord Farquaad, have decreed it. And thus began the most bizarre battle the world had ever seen. On one side, the Hysteria King, his loyal chicken army at his back, their feathers ruffled, their beaks sharpened, ready to unleash a torrent of feathery fury. On the other side, Lord Farquaad and his clown army. A chaotic mix of slapstick and surprisingly effective weaponry. Who knew a well-aimed pie to the face could be so disorienting? As the battle raged, a figure emerged from the chaos, a figure of such unexpected awesomeness, such undeniable charisma, that even the fighting momentarily ceased. It was Jack Black, his long hair flowing, his beard neatly braided, his eyes gleaming with a mixture of mischief and rock and roll intensity. He wore a sequined leotard that would have made Liberace blush and carried a microphone in one hand and a half-eaten turkey leg in the other. Hold it right there, you pint-sized tyrant, he roared, his voice amplified by the microphone. Nobody messes with the Hysteria King's cheesecake quest on my watch. You dare challenge me, you, you overgrown bard. I'll have you know I'm a master swordsman, or at least I would be if my sword wasn't so heavy. Jack Black chuckled, a deep rumbling sound that shook the very foundations of the castle. Swords are for amateurs, my friend, he said, tossing the microphone aside. Tonight, we settle this the old-fashioned way, in the ring. And with that, he gestured towards a makeshift wrestling ring that had materialized as if by magic, or more likely the efforts of several stagehand clowns. The crowd, a motley mix of chickens, clowns, and bewildered castle staff, went wild. This was better than a jousting tournament, better than a pie-eating contest, better than, well, you get the idea. Jack Black and Lord Farquaad circled each other in the makeshift ring, their eyes locked in a battle of wills. Despite his diminutive stature, Lord Farquaad was surprisingly agile, dodging Jack Black's attempts to grapple with him. But Jack Black was relentless, his movements a combination of surprising grace and brute force. I, I curse you. Curse you and your cheesecake obsession. Finally, Jack caught Lord Farquaad off guard, scooping him up in a bear hug that would have made a grizzly proud. Time to finish this, he whispered, his voice a low growl. He lifted Lord Farquaad high above his head, holding him upside down by one ankle. Lord Farquaad's face turned a delicate shade of green. Jack Black asked, a hint of amusement in his voice. S5. Any last words, short stuff? Jack Black grinned. Sorry, pal, can't hear you over the sound of my awesomeness. And with that, he uttered a single earth-shattering word, Skadoosh. A blinding flash of light filled the courtyard. When it cleared, 
Lord Farquaad was gone, replaced by a pile of pastries? S5, I, I curse you, curse you and your cheesecake obsession. The heroes stared at the pile of pastries in stunned silence. There were croissants, pain au chocolat, macarons, even a few perfectly formed baguettes. It was as if Lord Farquaad's essence had been distilled into the most delicious, most aesthetically pleasing baked goods imaginable. A feast, a feast to celebrate our victory, our newfound pastries, and of course, the legendary cheesecake. And indeed, there it was, in the center of the courtyard, a cheesecake so large, so perfectly formed, so impossibly enticing, that it could have brought a tear to the eye of even the most jaded food critic. The heroes gathered around, their adventures, their battles, their near-death experiences mostly from indigestion forgotten in the face of such culinary perfection. Even Walter White, a man of few indulgences, couldn't resist taking a bite. Not bad, not bad at all. And so, as the sun set over the castle, casting long shadows across the courtyard, our heroes raised their glasses in a toast. To the Hysteria King, to the legendary cheesecake, and to the power of laughter, even in the face of the absurd. The courtyard, now bathed in the soft glow of the moon and a thousand twinkling fireflies, fell silent. All eyes were fixed on the legendary cheesecake, its presence radiating an almost otherworldly aura. It was as if the very essence of joy and sugar had been sculpted into edible form. This is it, the culmination of our quest, the moment I've dreamed of since childhood. He plunged his spoon into the cheesecake, the silver surface parting like a silken curtain, revealing a creamy, dreamy interior that seemed to shimmer with a light of its own. He took a bite, closing his eyes as the flavor washed over him in a wave of pure bliss, and then it hit him. The realization so profound, so unexpected, that it nearly made him drop his spoon. News of the Hysteria King's triumphant return spread through the land like wildfire, a wildfire that smelled suspiciously of cinnamon and sugar. People lined the streets, their faces alight with joy, eager to catch a glimpse of their beloved and slightly unhinged monarch and his band of unlikely heroes. Look at this, a grand parade atop a magnificent float constructed entirely of cheesecake. Peter Griffin, his pocket still overflowing with pastries acquired during the quest, tossed croissants and macarons to the cheering crowd. Even Walter White, usually a man of quiet contemplation, couldn't help but crack a smile as he caught a stray baguette in his arms. The real treasure, however, wasn't the cheesecake, or the pastries, or even the newfound appreciation for the culinary arts that had swept through the kingdom. It was the laughter, the shared joy, the sense of camaraderie that had blossomed between a group of characters who, under normal circumstances, would have never crossed paths. The quest for the legendary cheesecake might have been over, but the adventures were far from finished. For in the heart of the Hysteria King's castle, a new legend was about to be born. A legend that involved, of all things, milkshakes. I declare, I desire a milkshake. Not just any milkshake, but the most extraordinary, most ridiculously delicious milkshake the world has ever seen. Voila! Behold the creation of a lifetime. Chef PP, with a mischievous glint in his eye, accepted the challenge with gusto. He gathered the most unusual ingredients from the royal pantry pickles, mustard, sardines, even a stray rubber chicken. The heroes watched in awe, a mixture of apprehension and morbid curiosity on their faces. As Chef PP blended the ingredients together with the finesse of a symphony conductor leading an orchestra of flavor. The blender whirred and sputtered, threatening to launch itself into orbit. Finally, with a flourish and a triumphant voila, Chef PP presented his creation, a milkshake so tall, so colorful, so utterly bizarre, that it could only have been created by a chef with a sense of humor, as twisted as a pretzel. And the taste? Well, let's just say it was an experience that words cannot fully capture. It was sweet, sour, salty, and vaguely reminiscent of a rubber chicken. But to everyone's surprise, it was delicious. 